Welcome to Good Chris Elfian Talks. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. And I'm Brian. Thank you for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post a new episode at the start of each week with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to listen to. And now, let's talk more about this week's talk. Welcome to the Good Chris Adelphian Talks podcast. This is Brother Brian. This week's talk is an exhortation that was given by Brother Steve Cheatham at the Morristown, New Jersey Ecclesia just a few weeks ago. The exhort was titled, The Image of the Father. And the focus is on how we are all made in the image of the Father. But are we showing that to others? Is that what we think of when we treat and interact with other people? Is that what we see in ourselves when we look in the mirror and truly examine ourselves? Probably not. But despite what we see in the mirror, that is not what we should be either glorifying or be tripped up by. That in order to maintain this image, we obviously need to avoid sin and temptation, but we're plagued by or self-control. Thus, we acutely understand the chasm that exists within all of us. There is a desire to do right, but the inability to fulfill it. So as Brother Steve says, don't let that, though, keep you away from praying. Don't let that stop you from coming to meeting. Don't let that make you think that you're unworthy of God's image. That by consistently meeting together and marching together, as the Apostle Paul alludes to, we show God that we want to be a part of him and that we wish to be seen as Jesus is viewed, the mirror image of the Father. He ends with a great reference about our God is a becoming God and that how by our weekly meeting together, that is an outward showing of a desire to become a part of our God, recognizing that we are made in his image, even if what we feel we show is tarnished or a poor reflection. So as always, we hope this strengthens your faith and brightens your day. Brother Steve Cheatham, The Image of the Father. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you personally for your prayers on my behalf. It's really nice to be here with you and to actually be standing before you. That is quite a blessing, so thank you. I have a mirror here, and apparently it's broken. It's not the glass. The problem is every time I look into it, I see my own reflection. And that's a problem. It's not good. It's not the image that I want to see reflected, especially here Sunday morning when we consider our Lord, which we've just sung of. And before I go on, I just want to thank our pianist for that last hymn, which she's been learning all week. It really sums up what we're going to be talking about. Christ our glory. Christ in us. So we're going to be talking about reflections and images this morning. And we're going to start at a very odd passage. It's Genesis 9, verse 6. And I'll read it to you. Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Now we would read over that very quickly, but think about what that verse is saying. And what it really is, when you think about it, it's the whole doctrine of Christ's teaching in the New Testament of Jesus and the apostles in this funny little verse in Genesis 9. Now you think about it. Jesus said, love 
your enemies. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do good to all men. If a man strike you on your right cheek, give him your left too. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Whosoever compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Now you might ask yourself if you heard the Lord teaching this, well, why should I do good to these people? They're taking advantage of me. I don't even like them. Or you think of some of the other teachings of the New Testament of our Lord. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor. Or when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And again, you might say, well, why should I do this, Lord? And Genesis 9, verse 6, is the answer. It's because all of them are made in the image of God. Not just us here, but those outside. We are all made in the image of the Father. And for that reason alone, we treat all men with respect and honor. Now, let me give you an example. It might be a little silly, but, but it really illustrates it. If you were to Google on your phone, how do you handle a flag from the United States? Or how do you dispose of a United States flag? You would almost be shocked at how detailed and extensive that list is for handling a piece of cloth. And the whole reason is, is to show respect to acknowledge what it represents. How much more our Father in heaven, the one who made each one of us. Consider how this word image is used in Genesis. It's only found three times. Genesis 1.27, we all know, uh, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him. At the very start of creation, God sets the standard, all of you are in my image. And that's to us. That wasn't telling Adam and Eve what was going on. That passage is written to the readers. Genesis 5 verse 3, Adam bore a son, Seth. And what's different here, scripture points out, Seth was in Adam's image, not the image of the Lord. And the last place in Genesis the word image is used is, we're told not to kill because all mankind is in the image of the Father. And just a little footnote, just it'll tie things in later. Why does Genesis 5 talk about Seth being in Adam's image and not the father's image? It's because God's image had become marred. Seth inherited a disobedient nature from Adam. Seth's birth was the direct result of his brother killing his other brother, Cain rising up and killing Abel. And why? because Abel reflected the image of God and Cain did not. And so that, you call it a broken nature, a marred nature was handed down to Seth. And then after all mankind had been destroyed by the flood, only righteous, Abel, only righteous Noah and his small family emerged from the ark. And it's another new beginning. And so the principle is laid down for a new generation that you are all created in the image of God. Now, the issue, the struggle, I think, from the beginning is making our insides match our outsides. The clerk down in 7-Eleven is in the image of God, but I can't speak for internally of his character and his being. And see, that's why I don't like the mirror. 
instead of reflecting the Son of God, instead of reflecting the Father, it still reflects me. And that's something I need to deal with, as do you. And, and it really brings it to Sunday morning, doesn't it? Think about Paul's words concerning the emblems before us. And surprisingly, he picks up this theme. 1 Corinthians 11, 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Cain forgot whose image he was, and because of that, only sorrow fo followed. But here this morning, brothers and sisters, we think of the image we're to follow, to have in us. We think of the image we should be when we look at the emblems, the bread and the wine. And it's actually a bigger issue in the brotherhood among ourselves. In Colossians 1, 15, speaking of Jesus, it speaks of who is the image of the invisible God? We're going to get back to the emblems in a moment. Who is the image of the invisible? Now, how can you make an image of something that's invisible? Isn't that impossible? You think of Dan's talk a few weeks ago where he was talking about his plans and the image in his mind of building this podium and how he took something that was on paper until it's been realized in a physical form, which I'm standing behind. How would Dan have done making this if his pattern was invisible? It's a tall order, isn't it? Can you make an image of something that's invisible? It is impossible if we were trying to make an image, if we were trying to make a representation and then fill it in, shape it, sand it, paint it, stain it, and present it before you like the podium. And see, that desire to see the outward is the problem. The Apostle Philip made the same mistake. In John 14, verse 8, Philip says, Lord, let us see the Father, and we have need of nothing more. That's not what Philip needed. Philip needed to see the invisible, the real essence of the Father, not the physical. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long? and you haven't seen it? Right now, I'm looking at about 50 faces. All of you are a representative of our Father. All of us were made in his image. Our young, our old, male, female, children, teens, middle-aged, seniors, we're all here. And even those outside the wall are made in the outward image of the Father. But we all know that doesn't matter. It's what's inside. It's the invisible which we need to be seeking. Greek says, the Greek for it says, that which cannot be seen with your eyes. Philip thought seeing the external was enough, and it wasn't. So if I asked you then, now that we're thinking of the inward, Draw me a picture of love. Draw me a picture of joy. If I ask my Sunday school students, can you draw me a picture of glory and mercy? You can't. They're abstract concepts. But what you can do to illustrate it is you can illustrate love, a picture that shows love. It shows its effects. It shows love and action or mercy or kindness or goodness. We can show the effects of it. You can't draw a concept. So how do we see it? John 14, verse 9, Jesus said, as we've kind of alluded to, he that hath seen me, said this to Philip, hath 
seen the Father. It wasn't the outward, but the heart, the soul, the spirit. Jesus represented the Father. And so now when we go back to the emblems, that passage I read earlier, let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You know, that little passage has caused more problems because you might be feeling it this morning. You come here this morning and you've examined yourself and you really feel unworthy. Some brothers and sisters stop coming to meeting because they can't examine themselves honestly and live with it, to live with that image that they see. And they actually stay away from the bread and the wine. They stay away from other brothers and sisters who are trying to be like the Father. And that's a problem. Now, I've heard lots of explanations of that, let a man examine himself. But I'm going to suggest to you the easiest is right there in Corinthians. If we just let Corinthians interpret Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, we read, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. See, at the table of the Lord, this is where we acknowledge, this is where we desire, as we've just sung, even our opening hymn, fill thou my heart, O Lord, with praise. This is where we acknowledge our failings and we pray for the Lord to fill us. This is where we recognize that Jesus is working in us, that he wants to work in us and to be be in us. This is where we show, brothers and sisters, that we want to be part of that glorious body. You know, despite the week you may have had, whether it was good or bad, the bottom line is you're here because you want to renew your commitment. You desire to stay in the body of our Lord. Being here is the proof. So Paul to the Ephesians says, Be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. And, and the key word there is the word renewed. It implies something that's slipping. Something that needs to be strengthened. Something that needs attention. And here's where we identify that and try to deal with it in the week to come. Here's the crux. When we've had a bad week, we may not feel like we can break bread. And that's absolutely wrong. Galatians 5, 17, and, and listen carefully. We're going to come back to this verse. This is from Weymouth's translation. Galatians 5, 17. For the craving of our lower nature are opposed to those of the spirit. And the cravings of the spirit are opposed to those of the lower nature. Because these are antagonistic to each other. We all understand cravings, right? It could be as simple as wanting another potato chip. We know that cravings like gravity can pull us, if we allow it, away from the Father. Cravings can pull us away from the body, the path that we're walking on. And so as we talk about our weak and our failings and our need to try again, I'd like to share a secret with you, a true secret, and maybe it'll be a little eye-opening for you. None of us, none of us have the self-control we wish we had, we think we should have. None of us. You, you look around at brothers and sisters who you think are strong, 
and they don't have the self-control they wish they had. I don't. You know, in a study that I just read, it's been shown that almost everyone, and I just got to put the almost in there, but I'm going to say everyone has the same level of self-control, which in the end is very poor. We probably can thank Adam for that. We all have the same level of self-control, but here's the difference. In their studies, when they tested people who said they had strong self-control, they were good at not giving in to something. Here's the difference. Those people who thought they had good self-control, what they really found was it wasn't self-control, but they were good at staying away from the desires. That's what they were good at. They were good at avoiding things that would lead them to give in. And that's why they thought they had good self-control. When they put all the strong people who thought they had self-control and all the people like me who have weak self-control in the same room and studied them, they all failed. They all had poor self-control. The difference is knowing to avoid the temptation. I find that powerful. And so whatever my issues were last week, if I just take the biggest one and start dealing with it, start avoiding situations where that happens, I might appear to have good self-control, but I know better I'm just avoiding the sin. When I tell that story, I think of Bob Lloyd, who was way ahead of his time, uh, and he told a story of Mrs. Gottrocks. I'm just going to tell it to you briefly because it just illustrates it better than I can. She was a very wealthy widow, and she needed a driver. And she had three candidates, and she interviewed all three. And at the end of each interview with the three candidates, she asked him this question. I know a lot of you know the story, but she said, up on Cemetery Ridge, how close can you get your tires to the edge, obviously, without going off? The first man said, I can get my tires right on the white line and ride it all the way around that curve with no problem, Mrs. Gottbrox. So she thanked him, asked all the normal questions to the second, and finished with that same question. Up on Cemetery Ridge, how close can you get your tires to the edge without going over? He goes, I can get half the tire off the edge with no trouble, Mrs. Gottbrox. So she thanked him. Third candidate, all the normal questions in the interview, and finally she ended it with, up on Cemetery Ridge, how close can you get your tires to the edge without going over? And the answer was, I've never tried. Who do you think got the job, said Uncle Bob. It's the one who avoided it. How simple a lesson that is to keep us with God's image intact in us. Avoid the temptations. That's what self-control really is. So if you've struggled last week, don't beat yourself up. The simplest way forward is to identify your temptations and then take them on one at a time. Learn the best way to avoid it. You know, an alcoholic learns when he's recovering. You go home a different route. You avoid the bar. You avoid the friends that bring you to the bar. Whatever it is that gets you into drinking again, you just avoid it. Some people move. Some people have changed jobs because they want to avoid a temptation that they think is destructive. How much more should we? So this morning, we've talked about self-control and our need to recalibrate, fix the things that have been slipping. But let's get back to that verse in Galatians, and I'm going to read it now from the King James. Think about what he's telling us. Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh 
lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. So let's talk about desires and cravings once more. You either think of yourself, or you think of someone else who's in the midst of really craving something, whether it's a potato chip, or whether it's alcohol or something else, a substance that they're addicted to. Get that image in your mind of somebody who's craving something. All right, so just give that a minute. Think about how strong that craving is. Do you have it in your mind? You ready? The power of that craving we just read is the same power that God craves you. That same craving somebody has for a substance is the same craving, says Paul to the Galatians, that the Father has towards you to bring you here, to save you, to fill you with his glory. That same almost desperate craving for you is what Paul says the Father has towards us. How could we not want to be part of his body? What a reason to avoid temptation and our own weaknesses. The Father wants you so badly, says Paul. He's craving you. So when you sin, knowing that, don't you think that if you pray to the Father to help remove the first temptation you're dealing with, that he's not going to help? He'll do anything to save you. Put it to him in prayer again and again. All the things that trip us up, that make us slip, that need recalibration in our spiritual minds, put to the Father in prayer, and he will answer you. And when he starts helping you, do your best to avoid going back Work with the Father because he's there working with you. The more we fill our image with God's character, the better our decisions down the road will be. We will become more like him. We will think more like him. Talking about a mirror. Think of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Paul's talking about a mirror. And think about what he's saying. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now, we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. You see what Paul's saying? He's saying his mirror is just as clouded as mine, just as broken, it's dark. All I see is me, not the Father. And that's all Paul saw. His mirror was dark. It was not a clear reflection. Paul struggled with the things we're struggling with. But he tells us how to overcome. And Paul followed his own advice. Paul said we need to be led by the Spirit. And in Galatians 5.25, he says we need to walk in the Spirit. And, and here's the other thing. We all together are images of the Father. But Galatians says not only do we walk as individuals to the kingdom, that word walk means to be drawn up into a line together. Paul's saying we are all marching following the Spirit together. Never think you're alone. We are all marching together. Together, says Galatians 5.25. We're not alone. We bear each other's burdens. We lift each other up because we are all walking to the kingdom together. And that's why we need to be here. You know, I spent weeks at home watching this. And it's not the same as being here in person. It just isn't. When you're here, you truly feel like you're walking together. You're listening to each other. 
you're strengthening each other just by being here, just by talking about our week behind and the week that's coming up. And if we're walking in the Spirit, we're making progress. We're moving forward. We are all moving forward together, leaving our difficulties behind. And finally, I want to give you one more help. You're all familiar with the proverb, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I read a lot, and science has just proven that what Solomon said is true. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. There's a study. Again, sorry, I'm showing I like to read a lot. The study was entitled, Words Can Change Your Brain by Dr. Andrew Newberg. Words like love, peace, happiness. When you use those words yourself, when you say those words yourself, you actually trigger the brain to take you down that path. Your brain releases chemicals that support that mindset that support the words you're using. And just the opposite, when you use negative words, the, the fear section of your brain, I won't bother pronouncing it because I can't, but the fear center is then triggered. And the chemicals that support fear and stress are released in your body just by the words you are saying. Happy words, and they've looked at the blood, and the chemicals are released to support it. Nervous, calm, fearful words, and your body goes that direction. Isn't that amazing? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What words are you filling your brain with? Whether you say them or you're watching them on the screen and it's as if you were there. Are you saying words that will lead you to the kingdom, to the mindset of our Lord? Are you filling your image with that? Are you filling it with things that draw us away? I would love for us all to start tomorrow morning with these words. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And so, brothers and sisters, the table before us reminds us that we're all part of Jesus. Our brothers and sisters and our young people sitting around you this morning should remind you that you're not alone, that each one of us are in it together. The people outside the walls here who bear God's image should remind us that they need help, that they need to reflect not themselves, but the Father and we can start breathing those words into them. Brothers and sisters, when you come here this morning, it shows your commitment to belong to Jesus' body. It shows your need to share the emblems, to fill yourself, as it were, symbolically with our Lord. This morning, you should remember that none of us are good enough, that we all fail, but we all need to press on and not give up. And maybe the last lesson that I find the most important is your heavenly father truly wants you to be part of him. Not with him, but to share his nature and to share that with his immortal son. He will forgive you anything if you just put it to him. You know, I, when I finished this, I thought of the words of Brother Gillette, Brother Dennis Gillette, and he said in a little passage, our God is a becoming God. And that's actually what the name of the Lord means. I will be in whom I will be. God is growing. He's becoming more as we join to him and stay joined to him. Our Father wants you. And when we partake of the bread and the wine, we show him 
that we want him to. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. We hope this talk helped you in your walk. If you would like to hear more, please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review in Apple Podcast or whichever service you are using to help more people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this particular talk, please share it with someone who you think might enjoy it as well. For show notes on the talk you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash GCT or check the show notes section of your podcast player. Please share your thoughts on the talk from this week on our Facebook or Instagram pages, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks, on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel where these talks are posted as well. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to our email at goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media accounts. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.